um, hides are collected in one of the villages and brought to a trading post or if they're lucky to catch a trader in their village uh, they will sell them for, for goods in the village and then um, uh, you know go out and acquire more hides or, or whatnot. Um, once they're um, consolidated they're brought to uh, Savannah Town for more or for Congaree and then they're put on Paragos which are these small river boats that um, uh, haul somewhere around 1,500 pounds weight of um, hides down the rivers to Charleston. So the um, folks that are doing the trading all the way up here, um, you know, they might have some pack horses to bring them down, but there are also a lot of uh, instances where uh, folks are actually uh, creating their own bundles you know, putting them on their backs and then walking them all the way down to the Congaree so that they could uh, get a better rate for their uh, trade goods. Um, so when they make it to Charleston, they are uh, sold to one of the trading houses. And the trading houses, um, up until the MSC War, they all got their own uh, separate operations going on and um, their own warehouses and they're shipping them out uh, privately. After the embassy war, what happens is that the colony shuts down all private trade with the Native Americans in what an area that they call the settlement. And it's about, um, uh, well I'll show you in the later slide, but it's, uh, it runs all the way to Fort Congaree and then out to um, Fort Moore and essentially Georgetown. So they say that there's no trade but from that line to Charleston. And the only people that are allowed to do any trading are people that have uh, been specially commissioned by the uh, Carolina government to conduct the trade. And these folks um, had to actually give a bond of good behavior so that uh, they could go out and you know, do these jobs that they had been commissioned to do. So um, those bonds were sufficiently large that if they were called in, uh, you know, if they were caught by somebody doing something inappropriate, um, they would financially ruin not just them, but whoever sponsored those bonds as well. So um, they were pretty hefty um, financial uh, uh, financial uh, uh, bonds that you know, kept them uh, in their good graces. So the public monopoly, when they took over the trade, they were required to actually sell everything at auction in Charleston to the same merchant houses that uh, were operating the trade before the MSC war. And if you look at the prices that they're charging, um, well, that they're getting at auction, the guys that are running these merchant houses are probably getting about a 20% discount over what their original um, uh, rates were for these hides. So um, once they uh, were sold, they were packed up. And this is, this is Charleston. This is... Charleston in 1739. Most of this architecture is here um, during the Embassy War. Um, there is a structure right here that is now occupied by the old exchange building. That's where the public auctions were held, and these um, docks were where those goods would have been packaged up into large barrels and then sent to um, the UK for further processing. So, um, this is a 1720 map of London, and uh, leather tanning and all of those associated activities are a pretty smelly job. Um, it also requires a lot of water and um, has a lot of um, uh, disgusting aspects that you don't want to have near your house. So this, this area right here is the primary uh, tanning district for London 
and it's um, centered on something that's called uh, Bermondsey Abbey. And after those <coughs> hides are prepared, um, you know, they're sold out, and uh, the thing that got the premium rates was doe skin. And doe skin uh, was turned into, uh, this is a, a, a man's waistcoat uh, that's been embroidered with flowers. Um, there are uh, these embroidered gloves here. And um, the other thing that they would often use uh, doe skin for were um, book bindings. So it's the softest and supplest uh, skin that you could get, and you know, in a pre-plastic world, uh, leather that has those properties is going to be very um, uh, sought after. Um, these figures right here kind of show you how the uh, deerskin trade progressed after the um, Yemisee War. You see, you can see that the industry isn't really coming uh, operating on uh, all cylinders and. During the embassy, where they export, you know, 4,700 hides that year. Um, by the end of the public monopoly period, they're exporting 60,000 hides from Charleston to the UK. So, um, you know, absolutely uh, wreaking havoc on the deer population. And I'll add that um, the census on on deer um, population. Uh, over time uh, has shown that only now are, are they getting back to roughly the same population that they had before the deerskin trade um, really took off. Um, Alright, so public monopoly period prohibited the deerskin trade uh, by private people. This is that no trade zone and this is the capital S settlement for the Carolina colony. This is this is essentially um, how far in they're saying um, we want to build our, our plantations and uh, keep the Native Americans out. Uh, Fort Moore is at Savannah Town, and that is a sister trading factory to Fort Congaree. There's a smaller factory that's occupying um, uh, a small island um, near Georgetown that uh, is often raided by the Chiral and uh, it doesn't really do a lot of business. So the guy has to hightail it every, um, every time he, he, he sets up shop. And here's the Chiral coming and he's like, oh, i got to go back. So, uh, and then this is a sketch of one of the boats that um, are doing these journeys from Fort Moore and Fort Congaree. Um, the journals say that this trek right here uh, is a matter of um, maybe three or four days, uh, and then going coastwise up to Charleston is uh, probably another week. Uh, going up against the current, you're talking about a two or three week journey. So uh, that kind of gives you a sense of the the, the way that the uh, People at the station at Fort Congaree might feel like they're in a remote and hard to get to area just because of the duration of their travel. Um, so this fort that the Cherokee asked for, Fort Congaree, um, the Cherokee go down to the Congarees with about 80 um, warriors and they are waiting for the colony to send up a carpenter to guide them in their construction of the fort. And they're waiting, they're waiting, they're waiting, they never show up. So uh, it gets bogged down in the, the council, uh, it gets bogged down in the uh, legislature, and it takes them um, about a year before they can actually get uh, a group together of uh, people that they trust that uh, can go up to Fort Congaree to, well, they think they can trust them, they can go up to Fort Congaree and uh, start this Indian trade. And they got on that boat and they went up the um, coast to the Santee River and they made it uh, maybe a day or two up to the French settlement at Jamestown. And they got all the stuff off the boat and they ran away. They um, abandoned the mission. 
most of the folks that were on that first uh, group uh, expedition were indentured servants, and they saw it as an easy way to get out of that um, uh, seven years of uh, bondage that they were supposed to be um, that they're supposed to be taking on. So this is our only description of the fort. Um, it said you were to receive and put into a storehouse for that purpose. Uh, to be built within the body of the fort and a small trading room or house and some of the outworks of the same. So it says, build your warehouse inside the palisade. Uh, don't do any business with the Native Americans inside the palisade. Um, it's even saying, keeping the doors shut at all times is trading. Otherwise, the greatest precautions will be insufficient to secure you from their treachery. So, you know, uh, We'll, we'll see that a little bit later on with the uh, um, interpretation for how that fort may have looked. Um, this is a just a reiteration of how the um, fort was not really something that you uh, would want to be in if somebody say fired a cannon at it. It's a um, very um, weak uh, kind of structure. But it says that it will um, it'll keep the Indians out. So the folks that are working at the colony, um, uh, public monopoly, there are a few commissioned militia officers, and then there are this um, there there are two groups of people that are that are working below those officers. There are indentured servants that are owned. Those indentures are owned by the colony. And then there are also slaves that are owned by the colony. You know, the corporate body of Carolina has this person's um, uh, bondage, and they are serving out that seven years where they are um, working for the colony directly. Uh, the folks that are doing most of that hauling between the fort and the coast are either indentured servants or slaves. And, um, even though these are very, you know, expensive shipments, they're, um, you know, sending maybe one or two of these folks up to uh, gather the goods and then bring it back down. So it's um, it's a lot of responsibility as far as um, maintaining the operation of this uh, uh, monopoly. One of the first groups that um, we really have a good uh, record of working as indentured servants in the public monopoly are. Um, folks that have been expelled from the United Kingdom during the 1715 Jacobite Rising. Um, they were captured after the Rising fell or failed and they were sent uh, to prison and the mayor, they were sent to prison in Liverpool and the mayor of the town was a merchant himself. He said, you know, I bet I can get them to sign indentured papers. So he put them on bread and water. And, you know, often as not, these folks signed addition papers to go to these various colonies um, and work for seven years uh, to, to pay off their transportation. Uh, the thing, the, the one advantage of the public monopoly was that if you served for four years instead of seven um, out on the frontier, you would have that other three years forgiven. Um, the next group that's stationed at the fort are a group of retired British Army soldiers. Um, they had served most of their lives in the British Army. They were essentially living at the British Army retirement homes. And um, as part of that, they're um, sort of obligated to be the uh, inactive reserve of the British Army. And due to some um, uh, constitutional issues, the king couldn't send any, he couldn't raise any regiments to send them across the Atlantic, but he could tap on this group of inactive reservists, well, you know, basically people that have been, you know, put through the paces for their entire lives and are really not up for moving across the ocean and um, living out on the frontier, but that's, you know, what the king did, he just sent them over. So um, they were supposed to go 
And um, let's see if I can go back. They were they were supposed to go to um, a place called Fort King George, which is located in between St. Augustine and uh, Charleston, basically guarding the Spanish raids. But they were in such poor condition when they reached Charleston that they actually needed to um, spend a few weeks recuperating. And uh, the MSC war threats of violence on the frontier kind of like uh, backed off to the point that they felt like they could send them up to Fort Congaree. So those folks stay there for a few months, and at the end of their um, uh, tenure, uh, they're actually told to just burn the fort down, don't leave it for anybody, and uh, then they're shipped over to uh, Fort King George. We don't know for certain if they actually went through with that last bit. Um, after the uh, the fort is abandoned, you know it's conveniently located right at the uh, township of Saxgotha, uh, which you know would almost suggest that you know there's already an occupation there that um, you know they're laying out this kind of arbitrary township around an area that they know people. Um, are uh, conveniently located at. And uh, we start to lose Fort Congaree in the record at this point. Um, there are some later maps that, that point it out, um, but um, after Saxgotha and the, the settlement of Granby kind of keep moving up the river towards Columbia, um, a lot of this area was converted to agricultural fields. And um, this is a 1939 image of the field. Um, the fort is located right here. And this is significant because this tree line actually preserved a better section of the fort than, um, than the agricultural fields. And um, in 1985 is when um, the pine trees that are out there right now were planted. So, um, you know, if you want to visualize what um, that area looked like for most of the um, history of South Carolina. It, it's something akin to that. Uh, and then the other significant thing that happens that also disturbs the site is the um, destruction or the construction, sorry, of earthworks in preparation for um, the Battle of Congaree Creek. Um, so these are the identified segments of the battlefield earthworks and Fort Congaree is located right here and you'll see this in some of the LIDAR data. It has a, um, a very pronounced um, visual signature. So this is um, light detection and ranging data that has been um, put through a program to um, show you what the terrain looks like. Um, these lines right here are the motor grader cuts for the first uh, archaeological attempt to find the fort. And um, those were excavated in 1974 by David Anderson and the Archaeological Society of South Carolina. Notice they kind of stop right here. So 1989, um, Jim Mickey goes out to try and locate the fort. He says, well, they've already looked all over this landform, so I'm going to try close to the river. And he goes to, I think, 10 places and um, with backhoe. And what he's looking for is a, is a profile for a, um, or a cross-section of, of something that he can say, this is the fort. He's looking for a ditch or something like that. So he goes around with the backhoe, uh, doesn't find anything. He's like, well, let, let's just probe around where that old uh, motor grader cut was. And sure enough, he found um, two sides of the fort. And uh, he went back and did some hand excavation, again with the Archaeology Society. And this is one of the profiles of the ditch that he, he saw in the um, uh, trenches. And he put in some hand excavated units to kind of um, collect a little bit better data. This right here, and, and uh, this stratum right here and this stratum right here are both composed of flood deposits. So the, all of this is stuff that has been laid down on the site uh, probably 
since the 19th century. So in 2010, I uh, went out and uh, with a group of students, uh, excavated um, shovel tests across the site, 214 of them. And what we were looking for was to find artifacts and see what the extent of the artifact deposit was. And we got all the way out to here and all the way out to here, and you know what, that artifact deposit is still out there. And we still haven't found the edge of it. But we do have the edge of the uh, early 18th century occupation. Uh, we found two features. Uh, one of them had this really um, kind of kaleidoscope looking um, series of uh, sand lenses. And we had another one that had a um, very dark um, uh, color and a kind of a greasy texture, which is something that we look for when we're trying to find um, areas that people uh, lived in. And uh, we went and we did metal detection, found 321 artifacts doing metal detection. Um, all of these had to be conserved and um, uh, recorded with a total station, which is a machine that lets us um, plot things uh, very accurately. Um, a lot of this material out here is actually outside of the fort. So we'll, I'll show you in a second. This is about where the fort ends. Um, and then we did unit excavation. So we did these, these big square units um, where we excavated down in uh, five centimeter levels. And um, at the end of the excavations, we had these nice profiles that we could use to um, kind of understand the deposition at the site. And this is that same uh, red alluvium that showed up in the uh, and, and Mickey's work, and uh, Mike, actually, this is the one that is where the bridge is. So that's um, that area that you know, got um, some kind of a trench running through it before we got there. Uh, and then this is a feature, this is a, some kind of a post that we found also. And um, it's located over here. So these are this kind of shows you the full extent of the excavations that we did. Uh, we meaning um, Jim Mickey's excavations and um, our uh, excavations in the 20 teens. And um, this is the best candidate that I have right now for where um, Native Americans contemporaneous with Fort Concrete might have been uh, might have been active. Um, the um, excavations showed us um, two lines of the enclosure that surrounds the, uh, the fort. So what Mickey interpreted was that there was a bastion right here, kind of a triangular bastion, and that it you know, should be uh, square in, in plan. Uh, we also identified the foundation of the building here uh, in the 20 teens, and then we found a really good um, excavation for the trench right here, surrounded by this really greasy, dark soil that um, uh, was full of artifacts. It's called midden soil. And um, down here, there's a questionable trench. Um, or there's a questionable attribution as to whether or not that one is actually part of the ditch. But um, when um, these ditches show up, this is kind of their, their signature. They're um, sloping down from the palisade on this side. And um, the excavation is here. And usually the dirt's piled on the outside. And it's kind of uh, intended so that you know, if somebody's running at the wall, it can um, uh, kind of make them sort of have a stutter step, I guess would be the best way to say it. They have to figure out how to get through the ditch um, before they can climb the wall. This is on that uh, west side. This is a much more significant ditch. And it's also got a very significant flood deposit on top of it. And if y'all can see it in the back, these little lines right here, these are all uh, individual um, uh, kind of 
rain deposition episodes. This is like um, if you're if you've got this open excavation, you know, you get a good heavy rain, a little bit of material kind of finds its way to the bottom of the, the ditch, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then right here we've got an episode where uh, something's deliberately been uh, used to backfill the ditch. And you notice there's a lot of um, uh, burnt looking material here and a lot of charcoal. Um, seems likely that that is um, uh, evidence of demolition at the site, but maybe not demolition associated with Fort Congaree. Um, you know, the big question that we have after looking at all of the artifacts from the site is, what's all this brick doing here? This is 1718. Um, they're on the frontier. There's not a lot of um, uh, industry, uh, but we found a lot of brick at the site. And I don't have an explanation for that. Uh, the artifacts that we find in here are sufficiently vague that you know we know they're from the first quarter of the 18th century but because uh, Fort Congaree and Saks Gothard are so close in time uh, it's, it's something that the artifacts can't really tease apart uh, looking at the artifacts can't really tease apart this is a building foundation that um, you can kind of see an outline here it was full of bricks and Again, it was something that seemed intentionally demolished, like all those bricks had been you know, pushed into the hole and then filled in. Um, and because of its location, uh, I think that it's probably the storehouse for the um, for Fort Congaree. But you know, with those bricks in there, it's uh, something that you have to take with a pretty good grain of salt. Um, the artifact collection. <laughs> You know, we got somewhere around 83, 84,000 artifacts, um, about 160 kilograms worth of stuff. Uh, and once we get these artifacts, we go through uh, artifact analysis where we put things in groups and we try and find patterns in it. And um, the patterns really uh, for Fort Congaree that we're looking for are in these um, items here. Uh, we can't really look at these Native American items because of the long duration of the activity there. Um, you know, it, you can't say that you know the pottery that we're finding from there is Fort Congaree related or you know three thousand years old. So um, here's some examples of the uh, trade goods that we found. This is a hoe. Uh, unfortunately, it was so degraded, it didn't really survive conservation. This is part of a 17th century dog lock. Uh, this is a style of um, fire lock that uh, has this little latch right here that uh, kind of operates as a safety. Um, this is the side plate for a um, trade gun that would be contemporaneous with Fort Congaree. And then we found several of these steatite pipes and these are, um, as opposed to these items going towards the Cherokee, these steatite pipes are actually coming. The guys at the fort are probably buying these uh, as replacements for their um, uh, tobacco pipes. Um, here are some of the ceramics from the site. Uh, this is a uh, 18th century tanker that has the um, initials for the Hanoverian King of England, um, George, who, if you recall, the Jacobites had just fought a war against. Um, this is uh, some of the ceramics that would have been sitting on the table for the officers that were at the fort. And uh, this would have been the material uh, that, um, say, uh, food preparation, making um, soups and um, uh, milking the and the cows and all that kind of stuff would have been done with, with materials and vessels that were made out of these um, kind of cruder earthenware vessels. Um, these are some of the tobacco pipes, uh, the pipe bowls that we found at the site. These are stamped with the, the maker's mark and we can actually trace these to Bristol, England, uh, also in the first half of the 18th century. Um, 
alcohol was a big part of the trade, and you know we, we did expect to find um, some glass there, but uh, you know we do have some really good early 18th specimens. And then this one's kind of unique because it's the first uh, patent medicine bottle that um, is created, and it's for a product called Turlington's Balsam of Life. And they were so proud of this patent medicine that they actually embossed the front of the the, um, the bottles with it. And this is, uh, you know, still mostly alcohol. So I'm sure they were feeling good after they uh, <laughs> imbibed. Um, these are the types of ceramics that Native Americans were uh, making about the same time as Fort Congress was, was occupied. They're uh, what we call uh, burnished pottery. And um, they will have some um, kind of uh, decorations that are scratched into them on um, uh, kind of uh, imitating some of the earlier patterns that are um, kind of very intricate, complicated stamps and um, uh, ladders and diamonds and, and all kinds of uh, things like that. These are some of the, um, if not contemporary, slightly earlier uh, projectile points that um, uh, the Native Americans would have been uh, using at the site. Um, this is um, probably the only contemporary um, uh, evidence for military presence at the site. Uh, this is a hand grenade. So this is a cast iron hand grenade. This part right here is actually where the plug would go. And these grenades were intended for um, being dropped from high places. They weren't, you know, throw it like a baseball. These things, you know, even in that present condition, it, it weighs, um, you know, five or six pounds. So you're not going to get a whole lot of um, distance on it. Uh, these are some gun flints that were um, uh, made on material that comes from France and Great Britain. Uh, these types of flints are manufactured and shipped overseas. And um, you'll find that um, once these run out uh, anywhere that a, um, uh, somebody will try and find a ballast stone or um, something of this material and make something that we call a gun spall, which looks a lot more regular and uh, uh, isn't as efficiently made. All right, so ground penetrating radar. Um, this is the newest aspect of our work at Fort Congaree. And what ground penetrating radar does is it sends a radio signal into the earth and the returns that come back um, are plotted in a, um, in a map so that you can see various densities um, or differences in densities between uh, the signals. So um, 